Hello, and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Today on the show, we have Dr. Mark Springer. He's a professor at the University of Mary of Political Science, and we're here today to talk about the political uh, season. Pretty interesting season this yeah. year, didn't it, Mark? Excellent season. I mean, if you're into politics, this is this is prime time. <laughs> well, before we get started, tell the folks a little bit about yourself and, uh, and your background. Sure. I was born and raised here in Bismarck, North Dakota. Um, and I ended up uh, getting my undergraduate degree in political science at UND and seemed to enjoy it. So I got my master's and went on for my PhD at uh, the University of Nebraska Lincoln. Um, ended up in North Dakota and I've been teaching at the University of Mary for the last 10 years. Okay. Well, with that said, uh, let, let's get right into the season here, both statewide and nationally. We'll cover a little bit today. Let's talk about North Dakota race first in the Republican primary uh, with, uh, of course, uh, Attorney General uh, Wayne Stingham and uh, Doug Burgum. Uh, we have a debate coming up soon on Prairie Public, but how do you see that race right now? Oh, it's it's very intense. I mean, it, the problem, of course, right now, it, and this has happened nationally too, is that polling is off, um, and so people are finding it more and more difficult now with um, cell phones and, and other technology, people not having landlines to do actual uh, extensive polling and so finding out where voters stand and and you know where they're positioned um, is becoming increasingly difficult and so I think the debates um, from that perspective take on a, a more important role um, in helping voters decide. Well okay and you know uh, with all the the money uh, mm -hmm. Bergam is throwing at the race and it's kind of with a, it looks like an influx of out-of-state money uh, how big an impact will that have do you think? No, I think it's huge. I mean, the amount of money that's spent usually correlates well with um, electability. And so uh, the candidate that spends more typically wins the election. Um, but with an open seat like this, I mean, it's, it's kind of thrown out the window in that regard. Um, you also have a different dynamic because, I mean, Wayne Stengem is so well known. Um, and so that's, Burgum has to fight against that, um, that situation as well. And so I, I think it'll make it more intense, more interesting. Um, it, it, most people probably already know this, but there's a lot more ads earlier in the season, so I think that's probably the biggest impact. Yeah. Are you surprised at, at Burgum's, uh, I guess call it line of attack, uh, specifically with the Affordable uh, you know, Health Care Act, uh, because some thought Burgum would take more of a middle-of-the-road approach? Yeah, it is somewhat surprising, but at the same time, it, and this is a good political answer, right? Um, yes and no, uh, <laughs> because you have a situation where if you're you're essentially the challenger, so to speak, I mean, Stengem is the better known candidate, um, you have to find something that will uh, attach voters to um, an issue that, that they want to talk about in the election. And, and so in that regard, Burgum is doing a good job in, in bringing up something that most, most North Dakotans um, are interested in. But at the same time, is it a played out issue? I mean, this came up again even in 2012 and 2014. And so um, is it at the point where um, what they call voter fatigue is set in? People are just kind of tired of that issue and, and might push it aside. And so I, I, you know, I, I'm not sure how that'll play out. It'll be interesting to see. Mm -hmm. Well, and let me ask it this way. In order, I guess, for Burgum to win, uh, mm -hmm. do Democrats have to cross over uh, for him, especially uh, in the eastern part of the state? Or? Well, that's really a, a potential with the primary because we have an open primary system. Mm -hmm. And so you could have um, quite a few Democrats cross over. Um, and I think that makes it a little bit more competitive in a sense. Um, but at the same time, if Burgum doesn't win the nomination, does that mean that he'll go as a third party candidate. And so, I, I, you know, with that money, um, that opens up that possibility as well. And so I, I, I don't know if he necessarily needs to win the primary um, to win the general election. And, and that could be a different trend or a different approach in North Dakota politics. Okay. Well, with the primary, uh, let's ask it the other way. What does mm -hmm. uh, uh, Wayne Stingham have to do? Sure. Um, Wayne just has to, I mean, essentially establish that, you know, I, I've, I've been there, done that. Um, uh, type of approach, uh, emphasizes policies that have worked, what he's done well for the state, um, and just reinforce those issues. Um, I think last week both candidates came out on the same side uh, with Dalrymple um, in stating, you know, here's, here's where we need to move with budgetary cuts. And, and I think that's good for Stengem to stick with what the established view is, but at the same time he has to separate himself out from that too. And so 
it's kind of a double-edged sword that that he has to do you know say look this worked well but um, because the budget shortfalls what are we going to do into the future um, and and establishing his own view of you know this is where government is going mm -hmm. Well, whoever emerges from the primary, will they be heavily favored against uh, Marvin Nelson, the Democratic nominee for governor? How do you see that? Well, quite possibly. Like I said, you know, the the odd scenario would be Burgum going as an independent. Then you would have, you know, a three-way race, which makes it really interesting for me, for a political <laughs> scientist, because then you actually have um, more debates, possibly more um, interaction with the candidates. And so... Um, that would be interesting, but I think uh, if they if the Republicans solidify behind a candidate, you know, and one of them wins, and they they all collapse behind that person, I think it's going to be hard for um, Marvin Nelson to move forward. Okay, well, let's look at some other races uh, uh, at the national level. Uh, how how do you see the uh, Senator John Hoven and then uh, Congressman Kevin Kramer? Uh, will they be hard to beat? No, I mean they've they've established themselves. They have the name recognition, um, and there's been some hiccups. I think in in particular with some of the challengers and and how they've gone about uh, making statements. And I think you know when you have a a strong approval rating going into the election, it's just very difficult. You have the name recognition. You have that established um, record that you can go off of. And I I think both of them have have set that up fairly well. Mm -hmm. So, so what is going on with the Democratic Party in in North Dakota? Is, is it simply North Dakota's is red state, or uh, have there been some self-inflicted wounds over the years? I think the last statement is probably true: the self-inflicted wounds. I mean, when you had uh, Dorgan and Conrad in in the system, and I don't think that we were, there was enough done. And I've I've heard about this quite often that there wasn't enough done to to groom potential successors, um, or s establish some base of support. Um, on what they had done while they were in office. I think there's potential, I mean, with what Heidi Heitkamp did in the last election um, and, and, you know, getting voters interested in, in her campaign. Um, but that comes down to that all politics is personal in North Dakota. And so that's really what the Democrats have to do is, is get it back down to the personal level. Uh, you talk about personal level. So how is North Dakota different from other states? I mean, uh, population-wise, you tend to know your representatives maybe a little better. Mm -hmm. Well, that's exactly it. I mean, I've, I've had interviews with Washington Post and New York Times, and they're always fascinated with North Dakota politics because they'll go out to the western and eastern part of the state, and people will say, yeah, I've met the candidate. <laughs> you know, and they're surprised. They're shocked. How do you do that? And, of course, bigger states, you can't do that. But in North Dakota, it's still that personal connection that you can make with people. I mean, if, if I were advising anyone running, the biggest thing that you can do is holding more town hall meetings, um, personalized events that you can get in touch uh, directly with a candidate. The ads are great, but and I'm not saying that, that money is, is not well spent, but at the same time, um, your direct contact with someone, especially in North Dakota, that's still that personal touch that people expect. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's move on maybe uh, nationally a little bit. Bernie Sanders, well, he, he may be running out of steam now. As, uh, Hillary w won uh, four out of five uh, states recently and also New York. H how do you see that race? Well, it's really interesting because, I mean, when it started off, and, and there's, uh, and this is, this happens, it would happen on the Republican side as well. There's presumptive favorites. How does that all play out? And then um, this hasn't followed the normal pattern that the Democrats are used to. But I think um, it actually will help Hillary Clinton when it comes to the general election because now she's actually had to challenge um, herself from an internal candidate, solidified her positions going into the general election. So I, I think for both sides, even the Republicans, that that's a, a good thing to have is that competition internally. Mm -hmm. But, you know, why has Sanders been competitive against her? Well, I think it taps into um, what I've been reading about a lot is this personalized politics that we have in the United States. Everyone wants their own candidate. And so, uh, and we have so many different um, pathways, so to speak, when it comes to political ideology. Everyone has um, their own media sources, their own views. And so, 
Uh, Sanders kind of taps into a different dimension of that. I mean, he's he's picking up millennials and and different supporters, um, African Americans, and in some states and and not in others. And so, you know, why is that? And and that's the hard thing to tap into as a political scientist because I mean, at times, he does really well. Um, and I think part of it is that angst that people have with the system. Um, you know, someone outside the system has to fix it. And so uh, even though Sanders has been involved, he always touts as, you know, I'm, I'm not part of this, this issue. Um, I'm somewhat independent from it. Mm -hmm. Well, now, do you think the Democrats will be able to unite behind uh, Hillary Clinton, of course, if she gets uh, the nomination? Uh, and do you see the passionate Sanders supporters getting behind her? Because some say they may not. Well, that's true. I mean, again, it, you know, this is as interesting as the state level. You have a potential uh, third party candidate, um, someone that can break from the party on both sides, in essence, that could break from the party and say, I'm, I'm running. Um, you know, political scientists have been playing this game online uh, about what would happen with the Electoral College votes if like Sanders picks up this state and Clinton picks up and Trump picks you know, and who's picking up which states. And so it's a fun exercise, but I think in the end, uh, most of the party uh, faithful, and especially with the Democrats, I think they're gonna fall behind Clinton and say, you know, we're gonna actually support going in. But I think there's gonna have to be some concessions made to Sanders supporters to say, look, we're gonna address these issues that you're, you're concerned about moving mm -hmm. forward. Yeah. Well, now, of course, it appears Donald Trump would be Hillary Clinton's op opponent. And obviously, we're, we're guessing here at the mm -hmm. moment with what's being what's being done. So uh, in the fall, uh, there'll be some must see, of course, TV debates <laughs> with that. But what anger is Donald Trump tapping into out there specifically, I guess, with white males and how his how has he harnessed that? Well, I think a lot of it, it, it and, and this has something to do with what Sanders was trying to tap into as well, is this, this anti-establishment and, and people kind of let, getting left behind, um, viewing that uh, the government no longer cares about the people or that there's no longer uh, a space for what they want to say. Um, you know, this is what Nixon referred to as the silent majority. Um, and I think that's what Trump is trying to tap into is the idea that there's, there's people out there that don't feel like they have a voice. And so it, it, I think this anger is coming from looking at what's gone on the last, you know, eight, 16 years for that matter. I mean, some studies even go back to 2000 saying that people have just become more and more disillusioned with what politicians say and do. And Trump is just direct. <laughs> and he, he says what's on his mind. And I think that appeals to a lot of different voters because there's there's no holds barred. He he doesn't care if there's a filter on it or not. He'll just say it. But yeah, so you're saying. But I mean, the things he says. There've been experts that say, okay, this is he's going down now. But his numbers seem to go up. Oh yeah, I was I was shocked and surprised myself when you know he said I can I can stand in the corner of what was Sixth Avenue and and shoot someone. And of course his poll numbers went up after that. Um, and most political scientists were concerned, wait a minute, this is not what happens in, in a typical um, election cycle. And so I think it's just different in that regard. Or, you know, the other theory that I've heard is that there have been a lot of crossover voting um, in some of these states um, that people that support Hillary Clinton are crossing over in the primaries so that they can set it up against Trump because they see that, you know, Clinton, Trump, um, Clinton will come out on top in a lot of the polls. And so... Uh, I think that's um, an interesting theory, but I don't know how much truth there is to it. Mm -hmm. Well, so is the Republican Party sort of in, in you know disarray with the infighting uh, over trying to stop Donald Trump? Well, I think this goes back to kind of the the Tea Party issue that the Republicans have been dealing with for almost a decade now. It, um, you know, how do you uh, tie in and tap into um, people that are upset with how the system's being run, the debt, things like that. Um, and, and I mean, this happened to Paul Ryan uh, recently, too, with uh, Sarah Palin saying, look, we're going to canter him. We're going to do what happened to Eric Cantor and, and get him ousted. Um, and I think some of that angst, again, is, is tied in with, you know, this anti-establishment. You know, let's get them all out and, and reestablish something that works. Um, it, which is an interesting approach because people hate Congress, but they like their own representative. And so it's always okay to get rid of someone else, but not your own person. So that never really changes anything. 
Well, so, so did that Trump phenomenon, you know, catch established Republicans off guard? Oh, definitely, yeah. definitely. I mean, it, it's it's something that, uh, and you can see that in a lot of the different arguments that are coming out now. Um, you know, that people that are saying they're going to skip the convention. Um, what does that mean if they have a contested convention? Um, I don't know if it'll really come to that because at the end of the day, I mean, this is one of those things where, like I said with the Democrats, you have to try to find a way to make concessions and, and get people moving forward behind you. Otherwise, uh, your party doesn't win. Um, but whether or not that's possible with some of the things, I mean, I, I was amazed that Ben Carson is leading, um, you know, Donald Trump's search party for VP um, and the things that were said between them. Uh, but at the same time, that's politics. I mean. Uh, it, it, it's business, it's not personal, and so I think a lot of people involved in politics just take a step back in that regard and say, all right, at the end of the day, we want to win. How do we do that? Mm -hmm. Well, then, is there, were there simply too many candidates earlier in the race uh, with, with the Republican side? Well, that definitely helped Trump, I mean, in that regard, because if you'd have a typical situation, um, someone like Rubio or Jeb Bush may have stood out, but, you know, because you have a crowded field, um, the attention, of course, gets focused on the person that already has name recognition um, and is a good sound bite. I mean, Trump provided his own um, entertainment value early on, just like I said, being unfiltered, and, and people picked up on that, and the press picked up on it as well. Now, you mentioned, of course, in many head-to-head -head polls, Cl Clinton defeats Trump. Uh, and, and she holds the lead over him, of course, uh, with women, millennials, uh, Hispanics, Muslims, and African Americans. Ha has Trump said too much to ever sort of uh, recover among those groups? Well, in politics, it's, it's never say never. I mean, the, it, I always compare it to uh, the weather in North Dakota. If you don't like it, wait a few days and it'll change. Um, in that regard, I, I think that uh, Trump can find ways in, it depends on who he picks for a VP candidate, um, how he moves forward with different policy issues, um, how he mends those wounds. I mean, it's, it's definitely in politics not, not what you've done, but what you've done lately. And so what sticks in the minds of voters at the immediate moment that they go to vote. And uh, he's got a lot of time to pick up and, and do different things that could help him. Well, uh, turn to Hillary Clinton for a minute. Mm -hmm. Uh, can Hillary run on the Obama record? I mean, Obama's uh, approval ratings around 50% now, depending on what polls you l look at. So is, is this her strategy? Well, traditionally, that's been a tough thing, uh, especially after the, the term limits on the presidency. How do you tie yourself and then distance yourself? I mean, um, Nixon ran into this issue in, in 1960, but then Eisenhower was still popular to a degree. Um, you had this with uh, Reagan, Bush, and you know, 88, and and definitely this was what Gore was trying to do was distance himself from Clinton in 2000, and so um, and McCain definitely did that in in 2008, and so I I think she does have to distance herself, show look, this is how I'm different, um, but she can tie herself to some issues that that resonated with voters, and I think that's what she has to do is find out what what are those issues and how do I tap into that. Um, that people want to see con continuation in uh, mm -hmm. for policy. So is the electoral map uh, favored uh, to a, a Democratic uh, presidential nominee? Um, there, I don't know if I'd necessarily say that. I think the issue comes down to, uh, they used to talk about red state, blue state. Now a lot of the times it's, it's red county, blue county, um, and then also the voter turnout. Um, because, I mean, if we keep seeing a decline in voter turnout, that might change. Or, you know, who actually gets motivated enough um, by the election cycle. And so um, it's very difficult to see if that's really the case um, because millennials are all over the board. Um, from what most of the data that I've looked at, they're, I mean, and they're the next generation. And so, and they've got a, I mean, this is a big election for them. And so what impact are they going to have on, um, voter turnout and will they actually show up and so and how will they vote um, because a lot of them are turned off from politics as usual and so does that mean that they reject the establishment and say look you know Trump is a better um, pick because he's outside the system or he's unfiltered or you know what do they like um, and that hasn't I mean there hasn't been enough polling done on on where they stand um, definitively on, on that type of issue. 
So what, what do you think? Because you mentioned uh, voter turnout. Mm -hmm. and that that t tends to be a, a hot topic. You know, what are you seeing, especially with young people, as, as you're teaching them and mm -hmm. talking with them? Are, are they getting more involved in, in, in political things or less involved? Less involved, um, unfortunately. And in fact, a lot of them come into college um, with very low civic education, um, very little knowledge. I mean, they understand the system. They understand the functions. Here's how a bill becomes a law, um, you know, the, the basics. But they don't understand how they can get involved on a personal level. I think that's something that needs to change and, and move forward um, so that they do get more involved. Yeah. Okay, you mentioned uh, contested Republican convention. Do you think there will be one to, to unseat Trump, uh, I guess? Uh, of course, we're giving it to Trump at this point. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, with the way things look and, you know, how intriguing is that situation right now? Well, for a political scientist, it's it's great. It, mm -hmm. It's it's you know a very intriguing situation. But I think in reality, and this is I mean this is what history has shown us. They they tend to find a way to move forward and, and get together um, by the time the convention rolls around. And, and and obviously for people out there, what does that mean to have a contested convention? Well. Basically, you have uh, different candidates that are put forward, and, and they don't like the presumptive candidate doesn't get enough um, votes then on the first ballot or the second ballot then to um, move forward as the presidential candidate for that party. And so that I mean that hasn't happened since uh, well, some people talk about 1968 and the Democrats and and how that became kind of an interesting convention, but um, you don't see that in modern politics, and so. I think it's intriguing, like I said, but um, in all reality, there's usually deals that get made before that it gets to that point so that people feel a little bit more comfortable with the main candidate. Um, they realize, you know, party is, is above their own personal views and, and it's business as usual. Well, we talked about Sanders and Trump. Uh, they both sort of tapped in uh, to the anger out there, even though they're on opposite ends mm -hmm. almost of, of uh, things. Uh, but, uh, you know, why is there such an anger if unemployment's better and the economy seems to be better since o Obama took office? A lot of it just has to do with, I mean, you have the government shut down, um, the, the contentious politics. I mean, people don't like conflict. Um, and I think part of it is just not understanding how government works. I mean, the idea that someone has to compromise to get things through is, is selling out um, in the vernacular. It's, it's you know, you're, you've compromise your own values. And so I think a lot of people look at politics in, in regards to how um, people are moving forward and, and getting things done and, and they don't like what the congressmen are doing. Um, it's, it's, it doesn't seem right. Or, you know, they're not tackling the hard issues like the debt or the deficit and how do we get through that. And, and it's making the tough choices. But then when the, <laughs> the congresspersons make the tough choices, they don't like that either. And so I think part of it is just a misunderstanding of how the system works. Um, in general, and I, and I think there's just that idea that it, it looks simple on the outside, but when you get into it, the nitty-gritty of politics, I, I think the comparison to making sausage really is, uh, holds true because it, it's not pretty. It's, it's a difficult process to make sure that people get, um, in the end, something that, that works. And over, over the last few years, I guess, party lines seem to be even more strict. I mean, it's strictly you're the Republican side or the mm -hmm. Democratic side, and there hasn't been a lot of crossover to, to get the, some of those things done. Right. Why is that? Well, we've had a lot more single issue voters. I think that's become the trend that people pick up on one issue and then they find the candidate that matches that issue. And, and typically, it, you know, like in North Dakota, it's probably something like abortion. And so the Republicans are going to cover that better than the Democrats will um, as far as um, pro-life stance or something like that. And so those issues um, drive elections a lot more now than they used to. It used to be that you look at the entire candidate and say, okay, they can do this, this, and this. Um, how do we move forward? Um, and now it's, you know, it's a lot of single issue or name recognition um, that drives politics. Yeah. Well, now, are, are you running into people out there now that are sick of politics uh, or are people more fascinated by it? It's a strange mix because I get a lot that come up and go, how can you be a political scientist? You know, it, it, this is, you know, the strangest thing in the world and we're such a messed up system and go on about the, how much they hate politics and, oh, how do you study that and how do you like that? And then I get other ones that are like, wow, this is fascinating. We finally have someone that's, you know, speaking to me. 
um, in the election or wow this is interesting because I didn't realize that we could end up with something called a contested convention and they, they're asking questions about that and so it, it makes it really you know polar opposites on, on where people stand because they either love it or hate it um, and again I think it goes back to you know, how do you address conflict in your life? And some people really, you know, embrace that. Wow, I really like this conflict and I want to find out more about it. And some people are shying away from it and saying, I really hate this conflict. How do we get this settled so that we don't, no one fights? Mm -hmm. So why do you love politics? Why do I love politics? That's a good question. Um, you know, I, I, I grew up in a household where it was discussed a lot. Um, we watched the news. We spent a lot of time. Um, paying attention to what was going on in the world and I think that was a big part of it um, and then there's also a lot of other things that you know I just I, I personally feel uh, are important to life. If people want more information where can they go? Uh, there's great websites that I would mention the candidates web pages definitely I mean that's that's a good start if you want to find out more about the candidates um, you guys do a great <laughs> job I think so. Uh, well Mark we're out of time I'm okay sorry. thanks <laughs> right. so much for joining us right. today. Thank you. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Post for this week. And as always, thanks for watching. This program is funded by the members of Prairie Public.